introduce our presenter. Oh, wasn't it a great concert we had as part of our I think it's got to be a first where we heard about a marriage proposal right here uh, before I think even her spouse or her future spouse would be heard about it. So that, that's got to be a first for our chapter. Anyway, I'm uh, very happy to introduce uh, wildlife photographer Jerry Miller. Uh, Jerry's been practicing the art of photography for many years, and for about the past 10 years, he's been focusing on, on wildlife photography. Uh, he captures images of free roaming wildlife in her native environment. And his travels have led him all over the place, including uh, photographing bison in Yellowstone uh, National Park, muskox, sea otters, and brown bears in Alaska, and most recently, woodland caribou in Newfoundland. Uh, he enjoys the challenge of capturing a unique moment in time in the life of another species. And some of Jerry's images have been published in Wild Planet Photo Magazine. And I, I've seen some of uh, uh, Jerry's uh, images, and they're really, really great. So um, please join me in welcoming uh, Jerry Miller. Bison give you a 
clear implication. They'll raise their tail. And when they raise their tail, there's one or two things they're going to do. They're either going to charge or they're going to discharge. <laughs> either way, you don't want to be close. So our second day in the interior, the night before, the weather went up above 35 degrees, and there was a warm wind. And in the morning, we had heavy snow, and two out of the rest of the day was off my heavy snow. Well, the road surfaces got so soft that the snow coaches were getting stuck. So we planned on going up the Hayden Valley, we couldn't get there. So we did get into uh, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, these are the, the low falls. Now, in the winter, Trump was spawns in the Rocky Mountain region, winter in the ice free waters of the Yellowstone. Uh, these guys are a species of concern in Yellowstone. Because of climate change and the loss of wetlands, the resident population is really declining. Swans need wetlands to nest. So they weren't the only ones in the Madison River. The bison were in there too. And these guys are actually really good swimmers. So this is a coyote in Yellowstone. They tend to be a little bit bigger because of all the meat that they can scavenge. And they're sometimes confused with wolves. But wolves were, they're only about a third the size of a wolf. When wolves were introduced into Yellowstone, their population dropped by 50%. But it started to come back. Now, ravens are one of my favorite birds. They have very different vocalizations. They uh, can mimic simple sounds. They can mimic human voices. They, their intelligence is equivalent to dolphins and chimpanzees. They do solve simple problems. And in Yellowstone, they learn to have onset and odd snap packs to get their food. All the eagles winter in Yellowstone. They tend to, in the winter, they, they feed more on uh, ducks and they scavenge, scavenge more on carcasses. So, midweek, we drove around to Gardner, set up in Gardner, and spent the rest of the week in the northern part, mostly in the Mar Valley. So, in 2020, I flew out to Gardner and rented a car and spent five days in uh, Lamar Valley, and this is what it looked like in 2020. This is what it looked like in 2022. A lot less snow. This is a bull elk around uh, Mammoth. There's about 4,000 elk that winter in the park. Most of the elk in the southern section will migrate down to the National Elk Refuge outside of Jackson Island. In the summers, the park estimates there's 20, 10 to 20,000 elk in the park. So this was uh, early one morning in Moore Valley and a frozen birch tree. It was 9 degrees below zero that morning. This was uh, a, a uh, ram, big one shoot. This was in 20, 22, 2022. This was the same area in 2020. Now, bighorn rams, you can tell their age by the number of sections in their horn. So this guy is about maybe five, six years old, and they purposely break off the tips of their horns when they start to interfere with their vision. This is a big one of you. Uh, females also have horns uh, a little smaller. And I'm sure everybody knows the difference between horns and antlers is that antlers are shed and horns are not. But there is a species in Yellowstone that's an exception to that rule. So we were walking down on the water and we were looking for river eyes. And this golden eagle came flying down and 
trying to catch a duck that was in the river. He missed it, which made the duck very happy. But golden eagles have the second fastest dive speed of any bird, uh, other than the peregrine. These guys can dive at 200 miles an hour. So the red fox in the snow is always a great image. And my first experience with foxes in Yellowstone was in 2013. I was in the park in the early day and uh, across the Black Tail Plateau heading into Lamar Valley. And there's a little picnic area. And there's a lot of people there, a lot of photographers. So I stopped and there was a fox curled up in front of what looked like a den. So I asked a few people what was going on, and the story was that that fox had had two kids, and there was a badger in the same area, and she had fought up the badger successfully a couple of times. Now, male and female would take care of the kids when they're born. So normally, one of the foxes will stay at the den and the other one will go up and hunt. Well, one morning, I don't know if maybe the male wasn't getting enough food to learn, but they both left to go hunt. Well, the badger came back, killed the eight the kids, and when she came back, she went into the den and she did something that was everybody's amazed. She brought out the remains and buried them. And then she stayed there for two days, morning. She curled up there and her mate kept coming back and she wouldn't leave. And finally, on the third day, she left. These are rock horns, and they are the exception to the rule about horns and antlers. Their horns have a permanent only core, but the sheath on it is shed every year. So the males will, their horns will grow uh, for about five years. They'll get bigger and bigger until they're about age of five, and then that, they stop growing. So the way you can tell a male and a female rock horn is that the male's horns are always bigger than their ears. And the male also have a black strip behind their door, which the females don't have. So one night we got a tip that there were uh, a group of moose uh, in the uh, Soviet Creek Ranch. So the next morning we got in there early, hiked in, snow was only about eight, ten inches deep, uh, but it was 17 below that. That was our coldest morning. And we could hear the bulls sparring before we got there. So normally, uh, most people drop their antlers like January and February, but I think this guy had a little help from the sparring partner. So moose and Yellowstone are the smallest subspecies of moose. The biggest is in Alaska, and the Alaska moose were about 40% bigger than the Yellowstone moose. This is a cat moose. They were in that group. There were five bulls, two cows, and one year old. So this was our last morning. This was sunrise. In a, in near Lamar Valley. The night before, we had found a uh, wolf kill elk harvest, and we waited there to hear the wolves up in a tree line, but they never came down, and it, got, it became too dark to stay. So we left, we came back early in the morning, but when we saw the elk uh, on the browse on the uh, top of the ridge line, we knew that the, the wolves were gone. But it was a beautiful sunrise. So in July, I flew out to Alaska to visit Nome, Homer, and uh, Silver Salmon Creek Lodge and Lake Park, Lake Clark National Park. So this is a map of Alaska and Anchorage is there, Saldana, Homer. So the Salmon Creek Lodge and Nome, way over here on the Seward Peninsula. So the first place I went to was Nome. Now, there's no roads going into Nome, and 
there's no rail service. You can either fly in or you can take a boat. In the 1900 census, Rome was the biggest community in Alaska, mostly because of gold hunters. But today there's only about 3,500 people there. They are famous for being the end of the Iditarod Slender place. And when I was there, sunset was 15 minutes after midnight, and sunrise was about 6 in the morning. Still people who were pressured to go out to Mary City. Uh, this road was one of the three roads you can drive on in the summer. This is the Nome County Road. Louder, please. So the reason I went to Nome was to photograph wild muskogs. And muskogs have been around since prehistoric time. But by the 1900s, they were gone from Alaska due to overhunting. And Alaska bought 34 muskogs from Greenland, had them shipped to Fairbanks for reintroduction. And in 1970, they reintroduced them on the Seward Peninsula. So this is female. Uh, females have the ones too. They're much smaller, especially across the top of their head. Uh, Muskoks uh, have two layers of uh, fur. The outer layer is just long hairs, and the inner layer is called kivia, and it's softer and finer than cashmere, and it's eight times warmer than wool. So this was a cougar road that went down into the Pokemon Mountains. And uh, there's no rental car agencies in Nome. Two hotels rent cars. So I rented a car from my hotel so I could explore the uh, three roads. And I left to go out um, the Pokemon Road, and I was about 20 miles outside of town, and the check engine light came on. So, I stopped and looked, made sure there wasn't any big leaks. But I knew if I had went back, I probably wouldn't get another call. So I figured, well, let me keep going and see what happens. So I did. And after about 15 miles of hitting wall potholes, the light went out. So I figured that was a good sign. So I kept going. And at about 65 miles out, I did come up on a uh, herd of muskogs. So it was good to be there with them. I spent about an hour with them by myself before they wandered over. So this is a female, the Kugli Mountains in the background, and Alaska is warming twice as fast as any state in the United States. And scientists thought that with the warmth and the permafrost melting, that these ponds on this country, there'd be more ponds on the country. But what they actually found out is that the ponds are all drying up. This is a bull. Uh, they are about 800 pounds. They're kind of short. They only are about five foot at the shoulders. The female in the front is uh, a little smaller. They weigh about maybe four or five hundred pounds. So this this was kind of funny. The, uh, the one on the right is a female. The guy on the left is the male bull. And she kept walking away from the herd. He kept going over and trying to get her to come back. And she flat out refused. <laughs> After about three or four times, he just sold back to the herd and she took off over the bridge and was gone. <laughs> so when muskox are threatened by predators, if, like, if there's multiple predators, like a wolf pack, they'll form a circle and they'll put all the calves in the middle. But if there's one predator, like a grizzly, they'll make a line and they'll put the calf behind them. So when I was kind of getting close to them, they, they kind of made a line and uh, the calves were curious though, so they kept poking their heads out. So the line didn't work very well. This was another calf that was. Uh, Taking a glimpse. This was a mom and a calf, and she was kind of cuddling up to her mom. <coughs> so these two females, 
I don't know what they're talking about. But the one on the right didn't seem like it. She liked what was going on. So three, after three days in Long, I flew back to Anchorage and flew down to Kenai, which is the regional airport, rented a car, and the next day drove down to Homer to take a boat trip down to the country back bed. And I wanted to photograph uh, sea otters. So sea otters are a keystone species, and they maintain the balance in the kelp forest. They feed on sea urchins that feeds on kelp. So if they're not there to control the sea urchin population, the kelp, the uh, sea urchins will devastate the kelp. So sea otters spend all their time on the water. Very rarely do they come on land. They eat on the water, they sleep on the water, they mate on the water, and they give birth on the water. They get most of their hydration from the prey that they eat, but they, they have large kidneys and they can extract fresh water from the salt water. So sea otters are also the only sea mammal that uses rocks as tools. They'll put a rock on their belly and break open plants, and they'll use rocks to dislodge abalone off the seafloor to eat them. And you can tell sometimes females from males because the females will have uh, wounds on their nose. And the reason is that when they mate, the male bites onto the female's nose. And sometimes it leaves pretty good wounds. So uh, this is a pup laying on his mom as they swim by. Sea otters are about four feet long. Males get up to about 80 pounds. They're pretty big. There's another view of the mom and the pup. So sea otters don't have any fat. They need to keep their coat clean to stay warm. So they're constantly cleaning. But I'm not sure if this female was cleaning or personal mate for what he did to our nose. So two of the three puffin species are native to Alaska. These guys are tufted puffins. And they feed on capelini and sandlines, and they will take a small squid. So the other species in Alaska is the horned puffins, and those horns are really a uh, fatty uh, tissue that is projects above the eyes of mature, uh, made, made mature puppets. So I drove back up to uh, South Island, I dropped off the car, and the next morning I met a bush pilot at the Little Airfield in South Island, flew across the Cook Inlet to head over to Lake Clark and Silver Salmon Creek. This is uh, Mount Redan. It's 11,000 feet. It's one of the three volcanoes on the west coast of Cook Inlet. So, Silver Salmon Creek Lodge, uh, before your reservation gets confirmed, you have to sign a liability waiver. <coughs> this is the main lodge. The upstairs is a dining area. And when you first get there, you get a safety briefing. I show you the orders and you get assigned to a guide. So my, I had that uh, half of that duplex cabin. There was a small path through the woods to get to the main complex. Now you can walk around that area as much as you want, but you really can't leave the, that immediate area unless you're with a guide. You do have to be careful because very common to see bears walk through here all the time. So Silver Salmon Creek and Lake Park is probably one of the best places in Alaska to get close to and to photograph brown bears. So grizzly bears and brown bears, brown bears are the same species. Grizzly bears that get most of their sustenance from the sea in Alaska are full of brown bears. 
And because there's so much uh, food there for them, they are a lot more tolerant of other bears than inland bears would be. And they're also a little less aggressive. This guy was in a river, there was some salmon, but it wasn't, at that time, there wasn't a big run. So he was kind of splashing around, but didn't really, uh, he didn't catch anything. This was early morning on the beach. There was a pretty heavy fog, but nice reflections in the tide in the tide pool. So this is a sow and a year and a half old cub. It will probably be the last year that they hibernate together. Cubs are usually kicked out after they turn two. He was doing a little bit of a ninja pose here. And when the tide goes out, bears go down to the, to the ocean and they dig for clams. And the cub looked like he was pretty happy that mom could go to work. He didn't bother him at all. They did wrestle a lot, and I think she was getting the cub ready for, to be on his own. She looked pretty old to me. She had a wound on the top of her head. Her coat was kind of blotchy, and I have other pictures of her, and I could see her teeth was pretty worn down. They are spending a lot of time, too, in the meadows. Uh, the sedge of the meadows is high in protein, so they get a lot of substance from the sedge. Ravens are, uh, they, their beak is not strong enough to open up the carcass. So if they do find a carcass, they will imitate a wounded animal to draw a carcass to open the carcass for them so they can feed them. There's not many, much other wildlife around. We have a lot of hungry bears roaming through the meadows and the beach, but we did see some sage grouse right at the edge of the forest and the meadow. So one night, this sow came through the complex with two spring cubs. Now, brown bears mate in mid-May through mid-July, but females have uh, delayed implementation. So five, if she made it in May, five or six months later, when she goes into hibernation, if she has enough fat store and she's healthy enough, the embryo will implant and she'll give birth to two to four cubs in January, February. Now, cubs are born in January, February. While the mom is in hibernation, They'll be born and they'll nurse while she's still sleeping. It's a tough life for cubs. Uh, mortality rate for cubs in their first year is about 34%. There were a few bald eagles around. This was a small piece of driftwood on the, on the beach. So, one afternoon, this, this is a male, about three years old. He was at the south end of the beach. And this guy was at the north end of the beach. They saw each other in charge, met in the middle, wrestled around a lot, like uh, teenagers. And the story is, they were born at the same time with the different moms. But for the last three years, they've been hanging around together. So they know each other pretty well, but eventually they'll be uh, pretty much be competitors. So ravens, I told you they're my favorite bird, right? So, but they are always up for having a little fun. They are known to sneak up behind wolf cubs and pull their tail, <laughs> and also make use sticks to make the wolf cubs chase them but they're not the only ones that they have chased them. So one morning, this bear came down to the beach, and I don't know what kind of grass he was eating, but he was pretty riled up. So we started out chasing the raven. Chased the raven for a bit, and he found a stick in the creek. 
I guess we were really lucky because we talked to a uh, truck driver that was on that ferry with us, and he takes that ferry, he said, two or three times a week. He's been taking it for a couple of years, and it's the first time he's ever seen dolphins in a cab straight. So about six hours out, the coastline of Newfoundland came into view, and this is Port of Basque. Uh, 12 days before we got there, on 
September 24th, Hurricane Fiona ran up the Atlantic coast of Canada, and Canadian Weather Service said that they recorded the lowest ever barometric pressure in Atlantic Canada. It did extensive damage to Nova Scotia and to Prince Edward Island, and in Port Basque, it destroyed or heavily damaged 100 houses, and it pulled 20 from into the ocean. So this is the Channel Head Light, right outside the harbor of Port Basque. That lighthouse, the base of the lighthouse, is about 80 feet above sea level. The people there told us that in the height of the storm, the waves were going over that island. So we stayed in Port Basque for a night, and then drove up to uh, Grosbourne National Park, to Rocky Harbor, and hoping to find some woodland caribou. When we got there, we talked to the rangers, and they told us the weather had been so warm all year that they hadn't seen any caribou yet. So they said, well, if there is any caribou, they would be up at the Western Brook area. So we drove up to Western Brook. It's about a three-mile hike to get into the brook. Uh, Donnie used the superpowers to make the sun come out, so we had a nice hike in. And this is some reflections on the pond before we got to the brook. So this is Western Brook. In the summertime, there's normally a boat ride to go into the fjord. It's the long-range mountains, and the fjord height, the walls of the fjord height, about 2,000 feet. Well, we still didn't see any caribou, but we did see, surprisingly, a family of loons. And real unusual to see loons with such a young ship this late in the year. That ship still had the uh, brown fluff of a baby, a real baby, and wasn't swimming yet. It was sticking its head on the water, but it wasn't diving. The parents were still feeding it. So it probably had another two months before the mature would be on its own. So we talked to the rangers and they thought it was kind of strange too, but they thought that the weather had been so warm that maybe the loons had a second clutch of eggs. So we drove up a little further north and we stopped at the Archers Provincial Park. And these arches are about, I don't know, about 18 feet up. Pretty interesting, uh, pretty interesting area there. There was another arch, but apparently it collapsed a couple of years earlier. The coastline in Newfoundland is pretty dramatic. Uh, this was the coastline uh, across the bay from where we were staying. Lots of cormorants along the coast. We took a side road on the way back from uh, going up to Western Brook and we came upon a bull moose. Now, moose are not native to Newfoundland. In 1904, the Newfoundland government decided that it would be a good idea to uh, have moose as meat for workers in the mining and the timber industry. So they brought four moose over from New Brunswick, two males and two females. Now the moose thought that was a great idea. There were no natural predators, it was ideal habitat, all they had to do was party. So the population exploded. And now there's well over 100,000 moose in Newfoundland. And a mature moose can eat 50 pounds of foliage a day. So they've done extensive damage to the natural forest area. So moose hunting is pretty encouraged. Actually, the day after we left the park, uh, moose hunting was open in the park. And it's, it's about a four, month, four or five month season there. So we did hear that there might be some caribou over in the tablelands area. This is a view of the tablelands from where we were staying. So we drove over there. We did see a couple of caribou 
through binoculars pretty far back and they were heading into the forest. Uh, we knew we couldn't get close to them, so we didn't, we turned around and left. But we did hear that up at Port Schwab, which was about two hours north of Rocky Harbor, there was a small bird on the coast. So the next morning we drove up, about a two hour drive, and as we got in, went through the town, got by the coast, and we did see some uh, caribou up on a bridge. So we hiked in, and we hiked in slow, kind of went in a way that we would get in front of the herd as they were grazing, and we did get close enough to stop the photo of So this is a bull. Uh, Woodland caribou are the, have the biggest body of many of the caribou species. Their legs are longer and their antlers are thicker and broader and their faces are longer. Now, he's about five feet at the shoulders and males weigh about 500 pounds. Now, caribou are the only deer species where males and females both have antlers. Now this is female. Males will drop their antlers after mating. Uh, mating season is around October. So they usually drop their antlers in November, December. Females will keep theirs until May, after the calves are born. So he, the, the dominant male here was not very happy with this uh, young male on the left getting too close to his two lady friends over there on the, on the right. So he came charging into her to break him away. He was kind of funny, he presented a little challenge. He was kind of like David and Goliath, but uh, David wasn't going to win this one. So he walked away and both laid down and the uh, young female next one gave him a little bit of a nose run. So he was pretty happy about that. <laughs> and uh, all, all wild animals view humans as a threat. So you need to watch them and see what kind of communications they're sending back to you. You want them to be calm and you want them to accept your presence so that you can capture their natural behaviors. So I kind of think we did that. Because after about 45 minutes, the whole herd went to sleep. And there's about six other caribou who had a frame here that also went to sleep. So uh, it, it was pretty amazing, though, that we could spend time with them along uh, with an invasion species. So finally, the night before we left, it did cool down. And uh, there was snow on top of the gross corn. This is gross corn mountain. It's the second tallest mountain in Newfoundland. It's 2,644 feet. Not, not really too big, but second highest in Newfoundland. So in our, I think best time was a writer in New England. And in mid-1920s, he bought 50 acres of land along the beach in Cape Cod. And he built a little cabin, and his plan was to stay there for two weeks. But he, but he became so fascinated by the wildlife and the natural world around him that he stayed there for a year. And he wrote a book called The Outermost House, published in 1928. And this is a quote from his book. And I think it's relevant today, maybe even more. Uh, what he said was, we need another and a wiser and perhaps more mystical concept of animal, remote from universal nature and living by complicated artifice, man and civilian surveys the creature through the glass of his knowledge and sees thereby the feather magnified and the whole image in distortion. We patronize them for their completeness, for their tragic fate of having taken form so far below ourselves. And there we err, and greatly we err, for the animal shall not be measured by man. In a world older and more complete than ours, they will finish and complete, gifted with extension.
attachments of the senses we have lost or never attained. Living by voices we shall never hear. They are not brethren, they are not motherlings, they are other nations. Bought with ourselves in the net of life and time, fellow prisoners of the splendor and travail of the earth. And with that, I say thanks for coming. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them.
Do you know who this now? It's 35 years old. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? Uh, how about a nice uh, hand for us?